Let's see, and Todd, are you all set? I am all set, yes. All right, looks like we've got a good number of people have returned. So yeah, so it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you this morning, uh, Dr. Fikado uh, Tafesa from um, the uh, from Oregon uh, Health Science uh, um, University, OHSU. And uh, he's gonna talk to us about uh, tuberculosis and alpacas and antibodies. But before that, as a brief introduction to uh, Dr. Tafesa, he received his uh, PhD in the Netherlands from uh, Utrecht uh, University, and then went on to uh, Whitehead um, Biomedical Research, MIT, and uh, really started to develop a, a program around how, uh, what's the host interaction between uh, hosts and pathogens with viruses, fungi, and bacterial toxins. And, uh, and that's been really a theme of his uh, research. I met him through uh, a then graduate student, now uh, Dr. Timothy Bates, uh, working on um, exploring the idea of developing a company that would use nanobodies as uh, ELISA reagents to detect active tuberculosis infections in, uh, in Ethiopia. And so we're gonna learn a little bit about antibodies and why they're ideally suited for that kind of problem. And uh, with that, uh, let me turn it over. Um, Mikado, you're on. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Oh, fantastic. So I'm very excited um, to be here today uh, to share with you our uh, recent work, uh, research, uh, recent work on antibodies. Uh, first of thank you so much, uh, Todd and Sandra, for organizing and the invitation. I think you guys are doing a really fantastic job. Um, so um, the title of my talk um, is Tiny But Mighty, Harnessing Nanobodies to Diagnose and Treat Infectious Diseases. Uh, before I kind of really start my talk, I just want to give uh, an overview of my research program um, at OHSU. So I started my lab at OHSU in 2016. After that, I established really multidisciplinary research programs and that I think I would categorize into four major um, uh, aims um, or research interests. Uh, the first one is really on host lipid pathogen interactions. I'm really interested in understanding how pathogens uses the host lipids uh, during infection for membrane uh, for entry replication and and also egress and also how they use the host uh, hijack this 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 pathway to effectively establish their infection inside the host. The second line of research is on antibody mediated immunity against emerging and re-emerging pathogens. We are really uh, interested in um, emerging and, and also emerging pathogens. Uh, we do have biosafety level three, even before COVID. Um, so we are really in, in the age of just really um, uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, pathogens and also uh, those and uh, so those pathogens that have a potential to re-emerge as, as a pandemic. So we are interested in those as well. The third line of research is um, our oh, nanobodies um, against viral and the bacterial pathogens. I will, I will talk more about that in a minute. And the third one is we use the multi-platform omic analysis to study vaccine efficacies. So we use lipidomics, metabolomics, proteomics to understand how a given um, vaccine can be if, uh, if, if effective uh, otherwise. Uh, not um, and then uh, to identify bio biomarkers to predict the efficacy of a given a given vaccine. So uh, typically, the main uh, uh, pathogens we use in the lab include Mycobacterium tuberculosis, HIV, uh, from flaviviruses like Zika virus, uh, dengue, West Nile, uh, and so on, and then and obviously coronaviruses as well. So. Uh, Today's topic uh, is really on nanobodies. Um, uh, we are very excited um, in, in the lab. Uh, I'm, I, I think, uh, I'm hoping that at the end of my talk, I will kind of really give you uh, why we are very excited about this technology and why we think they are extremely, extremely uh, useful 
um, uh, to treat and uh, diagnose uh, infectious diseases, especially those, those, those diseases that are very um, uh, prevalent and significant in developing countries. So uh, before I really start about nanobodies, I'm sure you know about uh, you know uh, classic conventional antibodies. We all have humans and the mammals do have conventional antibodies. Antibodies are uh, uh, composed of um, a heavy chain and a light chain, and also the FC domain. So they are really expansive. Uh, protein that forms uh, that forms this, this, this structure. So uh, typically, this is around 150 kilo Dalton. Uh, different genes are involved, get assembled in the in, in, in inside the cells, and it has to through has to go through the the secretory pathway to go into glycosylation and to undergo assembly and also maturation, which involve extensive glycosylation, especially. Uh, on its uh, FC domain, uh, uh, and, and and but but there are some uh, special type of uh, animals that actually have a uh, unique type of uh, antibodies, um, especially the camels, uh, llamas, the alpacas, and also shark. Even though I think cameloid is a kind of really have a, um similarity in terms of they are in the same family. Uh, but we don't really understand why sharks do also have this type of uh, antibodies. Um, so uh, it's meaning that um, this, this, this class of antibodies, so this, this animals, they do have the conventional antibodies. In addition to the conventional antibodies, we, the meaning conventional meaning that the heavy chain and the light chain, they also have the heavy chain. They don't only have, I just wanna emphasize because people think that they, this animal only have heavy chain antibodies. No, that's not the case. They do have conventional antibodies and also the heavy chain only antibodies. Uh, as I have said earlier, uh, this, this class of antibodies that we are really interested uh, contains heavy chains, meaning that they don't require the light chain to bind their antigen. It has a lot of implications, meaning that because they don't require the light chain for binding, one can just take the antigen binding fragment of the antibody and they use it as a binding molecule. They, you, can, you can express them as one polypeptide in, in, in without the other component of the antibodies and the steel binds uh, uh, to your antigen with the same affinity as you would like, as you would have it in, 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 in normal antibodies. So uh, in terms of size, um, the conventional antibody is around 150 kilo Dalton, depending, it could be plus minus, depending on the glycosylation. Um, the camelids or sharks heavy chain only antibodies are around 90 kilo Dalton. Uh, it means they lack the, 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 the light chain. Um, and then you can basically engineer those, in the, those the, the, only the, the, the antigen binding domains of the antibody to form nanobodies, or we call it single domain antibodies as well. Uh, so uh, they have obviously a lot of advantages to that because of really the small size. They have improved tissue penetration. They have very easy, they are uh, easy to um, modify using genetics. And they are um, easy to uh, not only ge genetically, but also chemically. You can, you can, you can um, modify them very, very easily. Um, uh, and because I think I think here the main advantage, as I have said earlier, is that is you just have only one um, uh, polypeptide, uh, and they are easy uh, to produce. They have very low cost of production, high solubility, and thermal stability. Uh, this has become extremely extremely um, uh, useful. Uh, the main reason I'm very attracted to this 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 antibody class of antibodies is that. 
their low production cost and also they are very stable at room temperature. You can keep them at room temperature for um, a week or two weeks, even for a month. You can come back and test their activity. They still retain that activity as well. So this has become very handy in, in those, in those, um, uh, uh, in those um, countries where, you know, uh, low income countries where uh, the, 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 infra, the, infra, the healthcare infrastructure is very, very um, not well established. So for example, I'm from, originally from Ethiopia and the, and, and, and the uh, uh, remote part of the country where there is no clinic, you can just basically uh, transport this ones without the need of minus 80 or minus 20 or specialized type of carrier. So that, that, that makes it extremely, extremely um, uh, handy. And also because you can produce them in bacteria, you don't really need a um, um, uh, mammalian system because they don't require really glycosylation for their binding. You can express them in bacteria and, and, and basically gram quantity we produce without even the formation of firm, uh, high scale production, we can produce gram quantity of this, this nanobodies. Um, and, uh, and also the other aspect of uh, this nanobodies, uh, attractive aspect of this nanobodies, have, they have very long CDR3 region. The CDR3 region is really a region that actually gives this nanobodies specificity uh, to, towards your um, antigen. They have very long CDR3 region by, by, by nature. For example, the conventional antibody that we have in humans is typically around 15 amino acids, but this ones, they, 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 it can be up to 25, 30, amino acid, which means that it can really uh, enable them to, uh, to penetrate regions that, 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 that um, is not, can, that cannot be accessible by conventional uh, antibodies. Because of this all advantage, obviously, they are very attractive for diagnostics um, and also therapeutic potential. I want to emphasize here that they lack, the, their main, I think, disadvantage is that they do lack FC function, and then, then, then also for any anything that involves uh, FC function, you can always put back them um, and install them into into the FC domain and the reconstitute the, the, the use them as um, heavy chain only antibodies as well. Uh, but in terms of affinity, in terms of I think avidity, they are comparable to monoclonal antibodies. There is no really difference. Uh, uh, we, we were able to generate PCOMO range uh, um, uh, antibodies in the lab. So their discovery pipeline is as follows. Typically, we use phage display system. Um, this is one way of um, dis, uh, identifying or generating nanobodies. One can use other uh, system as well. Um, typically, um, the workflow is as follows. We uh, produce our uh, antigen or immunogen. And then, and then immunize alpacas. Uh, we do multiple rounds of boosting. Typically, we do three boosts, sometimes up to six or seven boosts, depending on the antigen. And then depending on how much affinity we actually need uh, for our antibodies. And then once we immunize alpacas, um, we uh, collect blood and isolate PBMCs. Basically, you know, the, the cells that contains most of the B cells, and then, and then I, I extract RNA, synthesize cDNA from that. Um, and, then, and then it become really critical to uh, construct a very good library. The way we do it that we, uh, uh, this, the, the VHH region, the fragment that, 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 that binds to our antigen have a very conserved region, very conserved region. And, and, and what we do is we, kind of amplify the entire repertoire of the animal. And the library, uh, the, 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 the different sequence that you usually collect from that would be something around 10 to the six to 10 to the eight, nine. Sometimes we get to 10, 10 to the ninth, but that is rare. But if, if our library is 10 to uh, less than 10 to the six, we usually don't really proceed. 
But in any case, we try to amplify the entire repertoire so that we can keep the diversity of the library. And then, and then we clone the entire library into FedMid vector. And then, and then, and then uh, the, through the system, we basically express individual nanobodies uh, on the phage itself. So uh, the nanobodies will be expressed on the phage. And then what we could, what we do is we uh, immobilize our antigen into um, uh, plates or beads, and then and then we incubate our phage that expresses our nanobody library with our specific uh, uh, antigen that we used to, Im that we typically use for uh, immunization. And then we enriched, we usually do multiple rounds of um, panning enrichment, uh, and then we um, uh, uh, identify uh, the individual sequence that actually gives them that, that uh, affinity and then we we clone those individual sequences into bacteria express them and then uh, characterize that so this is this is a typical panning system basically our unpanned library there is pretty much in, in, in uh, there is no enrichment um upon um, first round of panning you see a sequence become enriched it means specific um, um a sequence is that that recognize your antigen become more abundant on your on your pool if you want to do even more uh, enrichment you kind of really do multiple rounds of um panning uh until until you get your your uh, best binders so i'm going to give you a few examples how we did it uh, in the lab the first one is again is, um, a spike specific antibodies uh, of SARS CoV 2. Uh, and uh, the way we did it is as follows we immunize alpacas with recombinant um, receptor binding domain of the spike proteins. And uh, I think for this one, we did four rounds of immunizations, um, one injections, and a three uh, boosting. And after that, we built that, uh, we used the phage display that I just described. Um, to identify uh, our 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 uh, hits and then and then we test them for their ability to block uh, a, a virus infection. So uh, this antibody is called uh, we call this SARBD1, and um, and the, one of the very first assays that we did is we we tested uh, by microscopy whether uh, our nanobody that we identify actually. Uh, uh, stain um, uh, 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 infected cells. Um, uh, so these are uh, uh, nanobodies that th 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 that was stained. So this two, all of them are infected with um, virus, uh, as 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 shown by the double strand RNA uh, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, but when you, we use SARBD1, it also stains those, those, those cells that are infected with the virus. But our isotype control VHH52 that recognizes um, uh, influenza virus and nucleocapsid doesn't really stain, showing that uh, we were able to identify um, a spike specific nanobodies. So um, we further characterized, we used, I don't wanna get into this whole details, but we have a, a bunch of methods of um, characterizing this, this uh, biochemical method to characterize this um, nanobodies. And one of them is ELISA. Uh, the other one is a BLI. This is basically just to measure the affinity of two proteins. In this case, the spike proteins in our nanobody. Um, and the, uh, the KD uh, of our nanobody is actually very, very good. Uh, it's it's in a PCOMO range, um, and its K uh, K on and off is also very, very stable. As you can see on this on this um, um, BLI uh, uh, data, once it, is, it it binds very fast and it stays for a very, very long time. Uh, uh, on the spike but uh, and the other thing uh, i think we were able to also determine exactly where it is binding it binds the receptor binding domain um um but not um at the uh for example the s2 region of the, the antibody 
So to test the neutralizing capacity of this uh, nanobody, we used um, a pseudo virus that, uh, that uh, these are uh, lentiviruses that uh, expresses uh, the spike proteins on the on the cell surface. And what we did is we incubated those spike proteins with nanobody, and then and then uh, we measured the ability of those nanobodies to block uh, viral entry. So as you can see by, by this confocal microscopy, um, when you incubate with an antibody, they basically completely block a viral infection. Obviously, we have done this with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with the live virus as well in our BSL-3, uh, showing that this is not an antibody is a very, very uh, potent in blocking viral entry. And, and uh, we, uh, even to improve the affinity and avidity um, of these nanobodies, we, we were able to uh, create a bivalent. So basically we have a linker in between and then we fused the, uh, the, 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 the nanobodies, we, we fused two nanobodies together. By doing that, we were able to improve um, uh, uh, the affinity even even uh, higher. Our BLI, BLI data was even were not able to detect. Basically, they stay together forever. Um, um, and and um, our uh, neutralization data also, uh, you know, uh, depicts that. I, I I think I just here I just want to show you that you can even if you find a weaker antibody by basically forming bivalent or by putting if a uh, bivalency can be also created by putting back onto uh, FC, uh, obviously here you would l uh, lose uh, that that uh, uh, advantage of being a small at all. Anyway, um, the other the other really cool aspect of this nanobodies is that um, uh, these nanobodies are extremely stable. And what we did to test their stability, we basically cooked them at 55 degree, I uh, know, after 50 degree centigrade for, I think, overnight. Uh, and uh, the, the one I'm showing here is for one hour. We have also done overnight at 50 degree. And uh, this protein is perfectly fine. It's really stable. Um, we, we were also um, uh, aerosolized it. Um, uh, and, uh, and that also didn't really affect the activity of the, our nanobodies. And uh, uh, we also did lyophilize it because th these treatments are very harsh to the proteins. If it was monoclonal antibodies, probably you lost, you know, hundredfold or a thousandfold uh, of their activity. Some of the monoclonals would have just crashed out completely uh, with this kind of treatment. This is, I think, some of the really uh, 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 th this emphasizes the translational um, utility uh, of of nanobodies. It means that this this nanobodies are really um, have a really nice advantage for uh, for for uh, treatments. Uh, this is um, again uh, showing their uh, uh, efficacy uh, and. Uh, and 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 then and, and again, you know, you can you can uh, test them again. It's a different variant. Our nanobody is very effective, but I just want to mention here that this nanobody was not effective. Uh, it was effective until Omicron came. After Omicron, it was not it was not uh, effective. But anyway, here is really proof of concept showing that uh, nanobodies can be used to treat for uh, for for viral infections. And also, obviously, we generated again it's different um, viral antigens. One of them is nucleocapsid, and the, in, in this case, it is becoming really important for diagnostic purposes. I don't want to go into the details, but we were able to manage really uh, around fifteen different um, uh, nanobodies that are specific to nucleocapsid. And what is really cool about this 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 uh, project was that we were able to identify nanobodies that are you know micromolar range up to uh, uh, picomolar range. So you know different diverse uh, type of um, uh, type of uh, nanobodies, which sometimes can be very very handy to try uh, because affinity may not be uh, uh, what you want sometimes. 
So in that case, I think having a different affinity range uh, is, 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 is good. So I think the other thing that I want to emphasize is that by doing bivalent, um, bivalent um, uh, uh, construct, we were able to improve up to you know uh, thirty five hundred fold, sometimes two thousand fold, um, by by just putting the 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 the, the two VHHs together. <laughs> And also depending on how much, how many times you boost the animal. Uh, in this case, we boosted two times and they were not as, as, as good binders. Um, and, but when you do four boosting, then you have really, really PICOMO range um, uh, 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 specificity. So this is just to show you that depending on what you really want, you can kind of really design your, your, your uh, a screening system uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, obviously, uh, I think as a scientist for us, one of the really important aspect of this whole nanobody discovery uh, is that we really uh, like to uh, determine exactly where our, our antibody is binding onto your antigen. So for this one, we use uh, this thing called HDX method, hydrogen deuterium exchange, to a map binding epitope. Basically, what we do is that we uh, incubate our nano uh, our proteins in this case, nanobodies, and also the, the its antigen together, and and then and then um, uh, we do exchange of deteriorated. We we incubate uh, uh, with deteriorated water. So anything that is blocked by um, uh, by binding should not have exchanged. So, and, and then after that, we do mass peak of that just to show which ones have just a normal hydrogen and which areas of the antibodies contain deteriorated ones. By doing that, we can map exactly where um, uh, the binding is, is, is occurred. So uh, we have also generated nanobodies again as uh, HIV, and then we have shown that uh, by uh, expressing this nanobodies inside um, a T cells, uh, you can block HIV assembly and 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 the release. Basically, just um, again showing that nanobodies can be uh, potentially can be used for uh, treating um, uh, HIVs as well. Uh, the other one that I really want to uh, take some time to kind of really show you is that uh, our work related to tuberculosis. Um, I think before I go into that, I just want to highlight why we think um, nanobodies can be very, very useful uh, for uh, uh, treating, but mostly um, for, for diagnosing, uh, diagnosing uh, uh, TB. So, you may not hear much, I think, in the US uh, uh, about TB, but TB is actually the top infectious disease uh, disease killer in the world. Uh, at any given time, two billion of the world population is infected with TB. But this is not necessarily active TB. Uh, it's also ne uh, latent TB. So um, uh, you can be infected with, with, with this bacteria. And as long as you are healthy, most likely you will be fine for like 10, 20 years. But as soon as you, immu uh, you get immunocompromised for whatever reason, it becomes uh, active. Uh, so last year, there were around 1.7 million people died of TB. 10.6 uh, million fell ill of TB. That means that they were, they were uh, these are active TB, not latent. So this are the, uh, according to WHO, the statistics, the statistics are very, very scary. Um, and um, and I, I, think, I think I just want to uh, emphasize that I think the, the, the economic toll that uh, the drug resistance TB could, you know, according to WHO, uh, MDR TB, uh, this is multiple drug resistance TB could cost the world up to um, uh, 16 trillion by 2050. So it's it's really, really a serious um, problem. 
Uh, it mostly um, affects um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Southeast Asia. Um, and and it, unfortunately, it's really directly related to the economic status of a given nation. Um, so we do have ter therapy, uh, TB therapy, but the therapy is very, very inefficient. Um, so if you are depending on, you know, what kind of TB you have, the treatment uh, ranges from six months to nine months, if you are lucky. Uh, but sometimes if it is MDR, it could, it could go up to 30 months, um, uh, which is really, uh, yeah, devastating. And then, then in terms of pills, um, you know, it's, it's it just imagine uh, getting 14,000 pills. Basically, just, just you know, uh, per day, you have really a lot of, uh, and it, it, this, this, this antibiotics are, have huge um, side effects. And, 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 and it just in general, it's, 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 it's a terrible disease um, that, is, that has been ignored, I think, for a very, very long time. Um, again, uh, as I have said earlier, I think the main issue, I think, uh, uh, in the future is going to be the drug resistance aspect of it. Uh, currently, we don't really have a very good um, uh, 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 treatment um, for drug resistance. And, uh, and this is, you know, uh, I think uh, the kind of really, the, uh, the if somebody follow efficiently, effectively, a given treatment, if you have just normal TB, you, the, the, the chance of cure is around 86, but that goes significantly down when you have drug resistance for one uh, antibiotics, because a normal treatment is really four or uh, three or four um, came, uh, um, uh, drugs combined. Uh, and, 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 and for extreme drug resistance, you know, it's used to be, at, uh, until very recently, it's used to be a dead sentence. We didn't have for um, uh, 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 antibiotics against that, but recently we had one that is, that is uh, helping, but it's still uh, more than 50% of individuals with XDR um, uh, would, would eventually die. So this is all to say that this is a very significant um, disease. And uh, my lab is uh, uh, have been working on TB for a very long time, uh, with the hope that um, you know developing um, a shorter, simpler, and a better therapeutics and a diagnostics. Uh, that is mostly really based on uh, this nanobody technology that I mentioned earlier. So this bacteria. Just let me give you a little bit about this bacteria. This bacteria have been around as long as I think humans. Um, and the vaccine that we have was approved almost a hundred years ago and in, in, in 1921, the BCG. It, is a, it seems to be protective for kids, but for adults, it doesn't do anything. That is why we actually, you know, it's not an option really. After that, we don't really know anything. This, the, 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 we, we, the, there have been a lot of failed vaccine trials um, and still there are ongoing vaccine trials. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, we, with, all, with all, I think, um, I'm, being, I'm being very realistic and it will be very difficult, I think, to develop vaccines. So my argument always is that if there is no, I think, um, one of, I think from COVID, what we learn is that if you are able to diagnose or early on, the chance of preventing a transmission is extremely high. So I think, in my opinion, if we, were, if we have a very, very effective diagnostics, the, the main reason the Western uh, countries are effective in, 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 in controlling TB is that they have a very, very effective um, uh, epidemiological kind of uh, screening system. We do have, we do have a diagnostic system that is working, especially in Western uh, 
countries, but those are extremely expensive. They are not applicable for developing countries, for Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. So the question is, can we develop a very effective, very easy TB diagnostic that, like that of COVID? So uh, to do that, I think it's really important to understand the biology of this bacteria. The TB uh, is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. It has um, a lot of virulence factors. It's secreted a, a bunch of um, lipids and uh, glycolipids, and also this is small molecules like ESAT6, CFP10. Uh, and, 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 and I just want you to, to uh, uh, see that this is the cell wall of the bacteria and lamb. And all of this, the one I highlighted here are very important for the pathogenesis of this disease. So the goal of our really um, uh, uh, lab is that, can we generate nanobodies against these virulent factors of TB that could potentially be used for, to diagnose and or uh, uh, treat um, this, this disease? So again, the pipeline is really the same. Uh, but um, the way we are using is we can express it in macrophages and uh, try to understand the disease and the relevance of a given uh, 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 virulent factors in causing disease. And also we can, we can uh, uh, direct it into a granuloma that is found in the lung and also obviously for diagnostic purposes. One of the... Um, one of the, the nanobodies that we uh, discovered uh, is that uh, this ESAT6 and CFP10, these are um, uh, secreted TB antigens. The BCG vaccine that, was, uh, that I mentioned earlier lacks a region of operon of the, of the bacteria that encodes for this to virulence factors. The difference between the virulence vac uh, va vaccine and, 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 and not the virulence factor, but the, 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 the uh, wild type TB uh, and the BCG is really uh, the, main, the main difference is this one, showing that they can be used for um, a diagnosis. So because of that, we generated nanobodies and that are specific to ESAN6 by immunizing alpacas, going through phage display and all that sort of things. And, and here is just to show that um, it binds, it specifically binds to ESAT6 by ELISA and also BLI. And, uh, and the KD is not perfect, but it is, it is um, um, it's in nanomolar range. Um, we were able to map the 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 ignore the title I, I forgot to change but the but the um um uh, using uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange method we were able to exactly map where our nanobody spine which would be um uh, in this uh, uh blue region uh, so when when it forms it it, it basically binds um, at the C terminus on on and also somewhere in the middle. So uh, the nice thing about uh, this nanobodies, again, is that you can express them inside the cells, uh, inside the macrophages, and a major way that they block uh, bacterial growth or not. So this is, we, we, we have a live uh, dead reporter strains of TB, um, and, um, and, 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 uh, and when you express the nanobody of uh, uh, ESAT6, it basically significantly reduces the bacterial replication um, as compared to the iso isotype control. And, and the, 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 the Sinano body also stains very nicely granulomas uh, that are taken from uh, 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 rabbits that are infected with TB, uh, showing that um, it actually infects, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, detect the real the real bacteria um and and then the the isat 6 that has, that has been released into the granulomas and um and then and, and also i mean i think i think i just want to uh uh summarize some of uh, our our 
uh, I don't want to show you some of the, the the data because of some uh, some um, uh, uh, other uh, issues, uh, uh, intellectual issues. But what we have shown here is that we were able to detect ESAD six within the granulomas and showing that they it, it can be used for um, uh, diagnostic purposes as well. And the other nanobodies that we generated is against NAM. This is one of the cell wall components of the bacteria that being shared into the blood and also urine and also in the lung. We were able to detect this and in, 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 in a surprisingly high affinity. And, and, and we hope that we will be able to use this nanobodies basically to uh, to diagnose a TB. And, 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 and as I mentioned earlier, this would potentially transform the way we treat this, this disease. And, and we think that we believe that we, we, we have, a, I think, a good reason to believe that it can be used for uh, uh, an, 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 an a very low economic setting as well. But anyway, just to, as, as in general, just to, sh uh, um, to show you some uh, uh, um, uh, that the, the advantage of nanobodies can be uh, multiple. Um, uh, we can use actually, um, uh, we are hoping to use uh, nanobodies to visualize granuloma development, granuloma evolution, just to, uh, you know, the basic biology of this. Uh, this disease pathogenesis in in uh, human primates or or rabbits, and also obviously we are um, we had a, a project that uh, looked at conjugating our nanobodies with antibiotics to increase the efficacy of uh, those antibiotics because, as I have said earlier, these antibiotics takes usually six months, nine months. You have to take it daily. The main reason for that is accessibility. So if you just combine, you fuse those antibiotics with nanobodies and deliver by aerosolization just directly to the lung, we may improve the efficacy uh, of those antibiotics. In a state of, for example, six months or nine months, if you could just shorten the, 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 the duration, that would be also something significant. Uh, obviously, I think um, uh, for diagnostic purposes as well. Obviously, we have a lot of projects in the lab. Um, again, it's different um, uh, pathogens, including, uh, I think I highlighted a little bit about TB, SARS-CoV-2, HIV. Uh, we also have, uh, again, it's flaviviruses, human diseases, um, uh, and, and then some uh, um, uh, uh, cancer targets as well. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, my lab. Obviously, um, there are a lot of people that are involved in this, uh, especially uh, Jules, Tim Bates, um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Savannah, um, Mila. Uh, those are the ones that are really involved in this project. Uh, and obviously, I want to thank, uh, thank uh, John Burke, um, for doing the uh, HDX uh, with, uh, uh, for helping us with HDX uh, projects and the funding organizations as well. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Right. Thanks, every thanks, thanks, thank you, uh, Dr. Tavessa. There are a lot of questions in chat, so I'm gonna. Oh, is that okay? Okay, let me see. No, no, you don't need to read them. I'll read them to you. If okay, that's easier probably. Thank you. And yeah. then, um, but yeah, no, this is great. This is really interesting. So the first question is about nanobodies and if they can dimerize or link antigens. Absolutely. Yeah, we have actually active projects on that as well. Yes. And do they aggregate or are they less prone to aggregation? Uh, it depends on the linker usually you are using. Um, sometimes they do aggregate, sometimes not. So that needs to be, I think, done in more protein-based, uh, uh, protein-specific uh, manner. Uh, but for some of our work so far, we did we didn't really see any aggregations. Um, we did we did see 
we did see, um, but the, sometimes depending what we had actual issue that depending on the, pro, the, the, the amount of linker you used between, uh, between um, your system, it can be very efficient or, uh, 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 or less efficient. I don't know if that makes sense. Laurie, did that make sense? <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, and um, there, there was also a question, uh, like a general question about uh, the functions associated with the FC region. So what are, can you just give us a little bit of, what's yeah. the about the FC region? So FC region um, is important for a lot of signaling events, uh, right? Uh, FC can be important for activation of NKT cells, T cells um, stuff, because, so the way, the way, for example, a complement uh, uh, antibody mediated uh, phagocytosis or endocytosis work is that you would have a receptor at the cell surface that are specific to a given, uh, right? Uh, for example, there are FC receptor at, on, on, that are displayed on immune cells. So anything that is related to FC receptor function is not included in this one. So if you really want those kind of uh, uh, functions um, downstream, I think the most common ones are NKT cell activation, uh, ADCP, uh, this is antibody dependent phagocytosis uh, uh, and so on and so on. So they, you would, you would have to find a way um, to kind of, uh, uh, if, yeah, if you need those, um, you, you have to put them back on, um, on FC. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, or people are wondering where you keep the alpacas. <laughs> and, and, can, and can you, can you make antibodies to, can you make nanobodies to more than one antigen with the same alpaca? Oh, yeah, uh, totally. Um, so okay, uh, let me answer first the the, the I think the, the uh, how we generate. So we can we typically uh, in, inject um, three to five different antigens at a time. We have seen you know we have we were able to generate nanobodies again. It's, I mean in nature, remember a given animal can be exposed to multiple antigens at a time every day right um so i i think it is it is totally normal to inject multiple antigens at a given time uh, but sometimes you have to be very careful some antigens can be extremely immunogenic as compared to the other so if we think like that then we try to not to inject two extremely immunogenic uh, ones we usually uh, uh we usually um do those antigens that are not too immunogenic because we don't want to dominate the entire immune responses uh, uh, towards uh, one antigens. But we were able to, um, uh, and, and, and in my previous, in my postdoc lab, they were able to immunize even up to 10 antigen at a time and they were successful. And uh, we keep our antigen, okay, uh, we actually don't have antigen um, uh, alpacas at the moment. We used to have one at Corvallis at uh, Oregon State University at the vet school there, mm -hmm. but um, but it become a little bit tricky. Uh, you know, my lab uh, it's only uh, it's, it will be just too much work uh, for you know too much paperwork to handle the husbandry and all that. So what we ended up doing uh, is that we outsource that aspect. There is a, a company who does who has around, I think, a thousand alpacas. I, and then they do this kind of immunizations. Uh, we send them our antigens um, uh, and then uh, they send back our, the blood. They draw the blood, they ship it overnight. And once we get our blood, we do uh, the race, uh, library construction, uh, BCL isolation and all that. And that company is called Car Carpralogics. So, uh, it's a little bit expensive, but I think 
overall it is totally doable. Okay, okay. Um, back to the FC region for a moment. <laughs> Uh, the, the stability, man, it's extraordinary. And the, and there's a question from, I guess, Leah about is that stability profile related to the lack of disulfides and lack of glycans? Uh, definitely, and uh, maybe not to the lack of glycans. I think it is related to the lack of disulfide bridge. Yes, and uh, thanks for asking this question, yeah. This this nanobodies, you know, the, the conventional nanobodies, the, the, the way the different heavy and the light chain, the FC, is formed is based on the disulfide bridge, right? This the, Here, they don't, you know, most nanobodies, if not all, they don't require disulfide bridge for their stability. So that makes huge difference. Okay. Um, there's a question about how boosting happens. Um, so the boosting happens just like the normal antibodies. Everything is really, uh, uh, just, you know, the normal ant uh, antibody maturations um, is also, is the same for single domain antibodies for heavy chain only antibodies. So meaning that if you just keep boosting, Think your B cell um, become matured and matured um, further. It's, it's, it's the same like uh, any other uh, antibody maturation. Okay. Um, there's a question about do alpacas, camo, camels, or llamas, maybe sharks too, but I, I'm not, <laughs> they'd be exposed. Do they get ex infected with um, mycobacterium tuberculosis? Um, that's a very good question. I have been actually doing some research for that. I don't know, really. I, I have no idea. There is not really much known about alpacas. Um, but my suspicion is that at least they get infected by environmental uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, you know, and uh, from the grass or from their food or from the, you know, depending on, at least I have seen one paper that, that says uh, alpacas, uh, that reported uh, alpacas can get infected by environmental mycobacterium, but I'm not sure if they get infected by mycobacterium tuberculosis. I would, you know, uh, someday I would like to actually do test that. Uh, and, and obviously for ICOC reason, we are not allowed to do those kind of experiments. At least not in the open air. So we're, we're getting lots of questions. So if you need to leave or any, at any moment, please let me know. But if you're good, we can keep going with questions. Yeah, it's fine. I have, I have, my t I have time until 11, so. Okay, all right, so, uh, okay. Uh, uh, there's a question about how immunogenic are the nanobodies that you generated to SARS-CoV-2 or TB? Yeah, this is a very good question as well. Um, because remember, we are generating this, this animal in alpacas, meaning that there could be some immune responses when you introduce into humans or somewhere else. As far as we know, we didn't really detect, at least we were able to inject in alpaca and in mice and rabbit, and we, we didn't see any any uh, antibody immune response against the nanobo the nanobodies themselves. But I think it is, it's it's a reasonable um, to think like that. To avoid this, what people have done uh, is that they um, humanize mm -hmm. the nanobodies. So basically, they 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 humanize the the, the codon and and all that sort of. There are actually softwares that you could just go and and use that. And there is one FDA approved drug drug uh, that uses nanobodies, showing that it is it is in principle possible to 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 use um, nanobodies again as therapeutic. But that is definitely something to keep in mind. Yeah. Okay. Um... Uh, Todd, I was wondering about this too, that camels can make both kinds of antibodies. And do you know, is there like a re immunological reason for one or the other or a switch or do they make them both at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I again, this this is not something that is really well known. Um, 
I think I think it, it, you know evolutionary. I you know it's 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 very unclear how they end up having this uh, that when they lost the 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 light chain. Um, but I think in terms of uh, proportion, uh, around thirty percent of alpacas or cameloids antibody is um, heavy chain only. So it's quite substantial. But again, the majority is uh, co the uh, conventional antibody. So, um, but in terms of advantage, obviously there is advantage. I mean, I think having uh, having only uh, a heavy chain, but um, uh, why only cameloids have this? I think I have no idea. I don't know why that's the case. Okay, I think we can do one last question. And also um, Leah says, thank you. <laughs> Before I forget, and uh, okay, so the last question is: If nanobodies are, are are nanobodies small enough to be imported into non-immune cells? Um. Yes, I mean, again, I think I just want to emphasize here that they are not um, as small as, for example, small molecules, right? Um. But they are definitely small enough from conventional antibodies. Um, sometimes this nanobody, the term itself is a little bit misleading, but keep in mind, this nanobodies are around 10 to 15 kilodalton, depending on the size of the CDR3 region. Um, but if you want to deliver into a given cell, you may want to design a way to deliver them inside the cells. It could be by conjugating into some sort of receptors. What is typically um, the case is that um, you would, in, in, in terms of, for example, I, I'm not sure if I have um, one slide um, where, um, can you see this? Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, where we used nanobodies as a payload to kill a given cell. In this case, actually CD, CD11 bits are myeloid cells, um, immune cells that are, that are uh, we want to kill. As, especially this, this type of things is really relevant in cancer research and autoimmune diseases and so on. So in that case, what we do is, um, we generate nanobodies again as CD11B that is expressed on the cell surface of that cell, which gives a specificity to that. So the nanobody would just directly bind to that and we conjugate, this is the, the active component of the uh, exotoxin A from Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So you just combine those and 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 uh, and the nanobodies would bind to that cells, then and get integrated. That then then the the, the 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 toxin will be delivered. So I think what I'm I'm trying to say is that you have to have because they, they don't have FC components, they don't get into the cells. And if you want to deliver them into the, inside the cells, you have to have a way to deliver them, whether by um, developing receptor-specific nanobodies or, or another method. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for coming today and talking to us, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was fun. Thanks. And um, right. yeah, we, will, we will be posting the recording. And thank you again. We really appreciate this. Of course. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Very cool work. Yeah. All right, team. So um, yeah, I'll have the recording posted tonight. So you can watch it again tomorrow morning if you like. Before we uh, take off to go back to our groups, um, I know some teams might wanna have a lunch break, <laughs> and but I'll let each team decide when they wanna do that. I do want to remind you that at 3.30, we will be having a software demo with Dr. Jaya Wong, who will demonstrate ICN3D. That will be optional, but it will be in the main room. And I will, what I will do is message all the rooms so that everybody is aware of that and um, everybody who would like to come here, learn more about ICN3D has the opportunity to do so. 
and I guess, uh, all right, so we have the software demo tomorrow morning. Just a reminder, we will open the rooms at 9 a.m. Everything, 9 a.m. Eastern time. There, This one will require a password tomorrow. It is a different Zoom link. You can find it in Slack in the schedule. It'll say, Tuesday, look for Tuesday. It'll say Zoom link right there. And uh, everybody's team, be ready to present your work tomorrow and let all of us know what you're going to do. And uh, when will I be able to return to our group? Um, give me 15 minutes. <laughs> all right. I'll be there in 15 minutes. And I'm going to open up all the rooms again now so uh, everybody can work that out. And it's great to see all of you too. And don't hesitate to ask me any questions. All right. I'm opening rooms. I'm going to leave it to you to figure out how to get to your rooms. And uh, yeah, if you need help with that, I'll stick around for a couple minutes if you need any help. I'm here, Sandy. I can take care of it if people okay. get stuck. Thanks, Alyssa. How how was it for you? Again? How was how was it tough for you? I I meant to segue. Um, say, please don't be overwhelmed. It is a lot of new. Oh yeah, I I got I got pretty lost. I was um, yeah I I was yeah. lost. I I understood at a very basic level. Yes, that's good. Um, that's all that matters. 